So it is my absolute pleasure to announce um, on our first keynote speaker, um, who is Tim Dwyer from Monash University in Australia. Um, and Tim will talk about in his keynotes on immersive analytics and embodied sense making. Um, Tim actually received his PhD in 2005, if that is correct, from University of Sydney. Um, back then he was already uh, working on visualizations uh, back then on two and a half dimensional visualizations of relational networks. And I think Tim is an example uh, of uh, members in our community who bridge the gap between the visualization community and the VIS conference and uh, the VR community uh, and the VR conference, uh, because basically he's successfully push it, publishing in, in both of these fields and he's combining those fields in his work. Because when we see, we see aspects of VIS analytics and we see aspects of VR and immersive. And, and I think he's really working at the forefront there, which I think is a highly interesting topic. And it's a good opportunity here to show what both or what unites both um, uh, communities. Um, Tim was, after finishing his PhD, uh, he was a visiting researcher and later a full-time uh, software development engineer at Microsoft until 2012, which also explains that he's also teaching uh, C++ programming, which I just learned uh, from his webpage. And, uh, but then he joined back to Monash in 2012 and, and is now leading there as a Larkin Fellow, and he's now leading there uh, the Immersive Analytics Lab. Uh, I met Tim, or, or I met his work, first time when suddenly all the work that I tried to publish, I got in my review comments, oh, you should write, uh, write, uh, cite Tim Dwyer and his work on immersive analytics. I think it's highly relevant. And then I was, oh, okay. So suddenly uh, it was, he was unavoidable, I would say, um, from, from multiple directions. No, uh, and I think it's really, really great work. I'm, list, uh, I'm really looking forward to know more about his work. And I said it beforehand, many of his work is very successfully published at VR, at CHI, at VIS, and at TDCG. So Tim, I'm, uh, I'm and uh, we as VR22, uh, we are highly honored to have you here. And I'm looking forward, we are looking forward to learn more about that really exciting field for the next 45 minutes. Uh, my only last comment before handing over to you is, if there are any questions, uh, please, uh, for Tim, uh, we will do have a short Q&A session after that. And I will collect the questions uh, that you can either put here in the chat uh, but also in the Discord channel uh, for the keynote. So with that said, Tim, over to you and uh, the time is and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Tobias. And uh, thank you very much to the, to the organizers of the, uh, of the IEEE VR conference for, for having me. Um, my only regret is that I couldn't be there in New Zealand with you in person. Um, it's wonderful to have a conference that's almost in my time zone, um, as I'm sure the, the New Zealanders are enjoying as well. Um, Anyway, so here we are at the forefront of, of virtual reality, both in the sense of uh, graphics, but also in the sense of, of virtual conferences, I think. So, uh, so within, with that in mind, um, let's think about how we, can, uh, how we can collaborate in immersive environments uh, into the future. All right, so I'm here as a, as a representative, uh, not just of my own work, but as the, the work of uh, our lab. Um, we call ourselves the Monash Data Visualization and Immersive Analytics Lab. Um, and our reason for being, I guess, is uh, to help people understand complex systems and data using the surfaces and spaces around them. And I'll explain what that means a little bit more as we go along. Um, just some sort of brief bragging. Uh, so we're Australia's leading data visualization and research group, um, which isn't actually saying that that much. There's not that many data visualization researchers in Australia. Um, there are there are growing numbers though. Um, oh, and I, I must mention, uh, and I'll mention it again at the end, uh, another advertisement that um, next year, the IEEE Viz conference is going to be in Melbourne. Um, so touch wood, touch wood, <laughs> it will actually be a, uh, an in-person conference as much as we can make it, or at least hybrid. So we'd love to welcome at least the New Zealanders, but hopefully everybody else as well, uh, in person to Australia to talk about visualization. And if there's lots of VR people here, hopefully we can talk about immersive visualization in particular, which would be fantastic. All right, so uh, let's go forward. So uh, yeah, just a few of the people who've contributed to, to this work. You can see this, this slide started off really quite tidy a few years ago. Um, and you can see I've kind of 
uh, tried to squeeze more and more people in as we've gone along. Um, in reality, they all have the same size heads um, and they are all equally important. There's, <laughs> there's no reason except for me trying to squish them in that they get smaller and smaller over time. Um, and there's obviously this is a, only a partial sample as well. There's many more people that I've probably forgotten and um, um, apologies. Um, I'm very grateful to all of you. All right. So uh, the, I guess this is a, a little story of, of a journey. And um, for me, it started off in the, in the early 2000s, probably as for, for many of you on the call as well. I had my first, um, my first dedicated graphics card in my PC. And I was very excited about the possibilities of 3D graphics for, for data visualization. And uh, this is actually an example from my PhD thesis. So um, there's many ways that we can take advantage of the third dimension, I guess, with, with data visualizations. And what I'm doing here is essentially um, extruding a two-dimensional time series curve into the third dimension. Uh, so this is a Phillips curve showing, um, showing economic uh, uh, what is it? Employment versus inflation, I think, over time. Um, and there's supposed to be an inverse relationship there, and you can kind of see it. Um, but anyway, there's advantages to extruding it over time. It, it becomes obvious that there's a linearity there, whereas with the, the 2D version, you have to put little labels, you have to put labels on each of the nodes to show which direction the, uh, the, the time series curves run. Um, but there are obvious disadvantages as well. And in fact, um, especially when you do it on a screen. And uh, this has been pointed out many times in many studies that, uh, that when you visualize 3D uh, on a 2D screen, you suffer from problems of occlusion, um, perspective distortion as you look at it from different angles. And also certainly at the time, awkward interaction, trying to use a mouse with a, a 3D visualization. Um, and this became kind of dogma in the, in the biz community that we really shouldn't use 3D unless there's a really, really good reason. Um, and a lot of studies that really showed, you know, significant performance disadvantages with 3D visualizations on the screen. But it really was, they, at the time, all these visualizations were on screen. It predated commodity VR headsets and really not many people were seriously trying to do visualization in VR at the time. Um, my best effort to do something a bit more immersive at the time was to build a little 3D model, as you can see there, and, um, and that had the advantage that you could pick it up, move it around, you could reach out and touch it, so uh, it was nice and tangible. Um, but obviously it's hard to, uh, hard to interact with things like that in a, in a more dynamic way using static models. Anyway, uh, this did become dogma, no unjustified 3D, and uh, Tamara Munzner in her very, very good um, data visualization analysis and design textbook from about 2015, um, she spent about oh, 14 pages sort of demolishing, um, trying to use 3D graphics on a, on a 2D screen. And uh, probably rightly so, but I have to say that, uh, that it made it very difficult for those of us who came along shortly after that book was published um, to publish anything in, not Tamara's book specifically, but this just this uh, pre prevailing view in the Viz community that, um, that 3D was bad. It made it very difficult to publish about immersive data visualization. And we really had to argue very strongly for, for why there could still be benefits, um, even in, immersive, in the, the newly emerging immersive VR environments. Okay, so why did I uh, get back into immersive? Uh, I guess the conclusion of my PhD, I kind of stopped doing uh, 3D graphics myself and went a little bit old school and did uh, 2D visualization for, for really quite a long time. Um, and then around 2014 at Monash, we be, were very lucky um, to have made available to us a, a very uh, powerful visualization facility, which was this Cave 2 facility that you see in the, the top left here. So um, this is actually, they're not wearing their, their glasses here, but it's actually a, a 3D uh, visualization. Um, 
And uh, many, many pixels. There's lots and lots of LCD screens there. There's a uh, Vicon motion tracking system. So for at least the person who's wearing the head tracked VR, it, uh, it is a very immersive experience. Um, but being hard-nosed visualization people ourselves, when we came along and used it, we, uh, we treated it just as a big display wall to start off with. Um, and, uh, and next door to it, in fact, we opened a, a more traditional visualization center uh, with a big screen, as you can see below. And that was intended to, uh, that was intended to be a, uh, a mock-up of a, a future control room kind of environment um, for power grid management and things like that. Um, but the question remains, you know, what is, the, what is the future of hardware devices for data visualization? Is it just bigger and bigger screens? Is it something like the Cave 2 facility? Well, actually, I would argue that it looks more like this, or at least eventually it will look more like this. So um, here, myself and a group of my colleagues were sitting around a, a table um, because of the elaborate uh, futuristic um, augmented reality headsets that we're wearing. Um, we can see, we can see uh, data graphics on the surface in front of us on the, this coffee table, and we can reach out and touch it. And we can see, uh, we can see representations of the, the data extruded into the into the space above the screen. And of course, this is complete fantasy uh, and a Photoshop. <laughs> but uh, in reality, obviously, augmented uh, augmented reality headsets are not quite there yet. Um, but we got quite excited about this possibility that you could have this really nice collaborative experience when you, where you can see each other and you can see the data visualization in front of you and interact with it fairly seamlessly. So that's kind of what we've been trying to create for a few years now. Um, here's another example. So uh, obviously when you have truly 3D, three-dimensional data, then you can actually have it in the space. So before we had the, the uh, map representation on flattened on projected onto the coffee table surface. Now it's floating in space. So um, as I said before, you know, when we present this stuff to the biz community, or at least a few years ago, we had to be very hard nosed about how we argued for different advantages. And, uh, and we did a bunch of studies. In fact, my student Yalong, who you see here, uh, did a number of studies um, evaluating globe representations of, uh, of maps and found some really significant advantages, which I'll talk about a little bit later. All right, so more hard-nosed analysis of where there's advantage to uh, visualizations um, in immersive or especially augmented reality environments. Um, I'll show you now and 3D. So this is a uh, this is a workplace case study of inappropriate uh, data visualizations that actually leads to, to fatalities. Um, and I'll stop it before it becomes. Uh, before it becomes too too distressing for anybody, um, but it is a little bit it is a little bit stressful. This scene, I'll warn you in advance. Um, but what we're going to see is a number of workers trying to use a two D display to understand um, a dangerous scenario unfolding around them, and uh, and the two D display really doesn't uh, doesn't show them the true uh, spatial nature of the danger. Tim, there's no sound, even though we tested it before. <laughs> okay, uh, never mind. So, um, so of course, this is a, a scene from uh, from Aliens, and the sound at this point is a beep, 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 which gets faster and faster as the uh, the aliens get closer and closer to the uh, to the Space Marines, and they don't know why. And then suddenly they look up, and uh, and and the truth dawns upon them. That, uh, that this flat screen wasn't showing them that the aliens are above them. So, uh, so yes. Um, I mentioned this because we kind of profiled this example in uh, a book chapter that's, uh, the book has just come out actually, it's called uh, Mobile Data Visualization. Um, and uh, it was the result of a, a really fun workshop and our particular working group focused on the opportunities for, for 3D mobile data visualization, focusing on what would be possible with particularly augmented reality displays. Um, so this cartoon is by uh, Magdalena Boucher. Um, and this is the scenario we just saw, uh, which we reimagined with AR headsets. 
and uh, and the AR headsets enable really quite a different scenario to, to unravel. So they quickly realize, these space marines, they quickly realize that the aliens are not just outside the doors, they're also up in the ceiling. So uh, they use their headsets to quickly view the floor plan. Perhaps it's even a, a BIM, a building information model uh, of the, the whole plant that they're in and they quickly plot an escape route and, uh, and away they go. And then they can do some immersive 3D data visualization to, uh, to make sure that all their vital statistics are okay and that they've come out of the situation completely unscathed. And uh, then, there's, then there's a joke um, for which I added a, a laugh track because it's really, it's really unsatisfying telling jokes when you can't actually see people. So I, I sort of made my own applause, but that's not gonna come through. Um, maybe I'll just ha 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 ha, yeah. Um, so obviously the, the Space Marine, uh, played by, um, played by Bill Paxton in this movie survives that scene and goes on to, uh, to star, co-star in the, the sequels to the Alien franchise with, uh, Sigourney Weaver. Anyway, that's, uh, one of my favorite movies and thanks for indulging me while I, I, uh, said way too much about that. Okay. Um, so immersive analytics is inspired by, um, scenarios like this, um, but I, actually I think it goes a lot further that with really immersive technologies, we have this opportunity to, uh, to remove the barriers between people and data, bring the data out into the world, um, not just on the screen. And um, more than that, it allows people to work really collaboratively as we see in this little sketch on the, the bottom right there. So um, whereas on screens, you have a really, asymmetric uh, collaboration environment. If you do it in person or if you do it remotely via something like Zoom, then, uh, then still you're not going to have the experience of actually having that, uh, that spatial proxemic interaction with the person around you. Um, also, I'll, I'll mention that in general, when we talk about immersive analytics, we take a very broad definition of immersion. So it's not just VR, it's not just AR, it's not just 3D. Um, environments, but anything that increases, uh, that increases natural interaction and engagement. Okay. Um, so in around 2018, we published this book that was another collaboration with a lot of people in the, in the Viz, VR and Kai uh, HCI communities. Um, which was really great to get all their input and kind of sketch out a um, a roadmap for where immersive analytics research should go. Um, a few years have passed since then. So what I was going to do right now actually was, was just uh, reflect a little bit on where I think um, the grand challenges for immersive analytics and immersive visualization in general really are. So, um, and remain. So firstly, we talk about embodiment a lot, embodiment of data, embodied interaction. And this has been discussed in HCI a lot uh, in terms of uh, people like Paul Durish and uh, uh, Don Norman have been talking about how, uh, how when you have tools, it changes your perception of your environment and what you can do in the environment. And in VR, we have the opportunity to create whatever tools we like, whatever tools we can imagine. And at a deeper level, what does that actually do to our perception of data and how we can interact with data? And I think it's a, it's a, um, it's a really quite intriguing notion. And it's not a new concept either. Uh, in fact, if you, if you look at this uh, example on the right, so that's a counting stick. So and I think it's from, the, uh, from more than a thousand years ago. So people have been using embodied devices to keep track of quantities, for example, and uh, and data more generally for, for really a very, very long time. And I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Um, so another opportunity with these emerging technologies is that perhaps we can, we can make data and understanding or sense making of data more accessible to more people. So on the right here is a uh, system that we wrote about in our group that we created and wrote about in our group. Uh, we called it Uplift. Um, it's a table with tangible 3D printed uh, building models and it's sitting on top of a, a campus map and you can pick up the, the building models and when you pick them up, um, the users 
typically wear hollow lenses and you see an expanded view of the, the floor pans inside the building and you can overlay with all kinds of data. So we were really excited about, uh, that was really intended for understanding energy use. We're thinking of scenarios, for example, uh, where multiple stakeholders such as the university executive committee, as well as facilities managers need to kind of come together and uh, think about different scenarios like rolling out solar energy across the campus. Um, what effect would that have? And so it's, it's a visualization not intended just for engineers, but for, for non-experts in energy, for example, as well. Um, and it's intended to, to enable really casual collaboration, more so than other visual analytics tools that are out there. Okay, and the third grand challenge that, um, that I really wanted to, to highlight is that Obviously, the, the current technologies for VR, uh, they're not perfect yet by a long shot. They're not, they're not what we see in movies like Iron Man or, uh, or Star Trek. Um, they, and in fact, they're very far from, um, from the ideal kind of visualization, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, just a few more words about, uh, about situated and embodied sense making. So that first challenge is uh, something we're starting to do more formally at Monash. We're starting to, to really map out these different types of emerging theories from, uh, from the cognitive psychology community and see how they relate to the established taxonomies of uh, sense-making activities. Um, that's ongoing. Um, the sense making for all, we have a number of projects on, uh, on that, um, which I'm happy to talk about offline. Um, some of them immersive, like this one here, this is a recently graduated student Kadek and uh, using interacting with, with, again, with tangibles. There's something about that, the, about tangible interaction that we think is really intuitive and accessible to lots of people. Um, also non-immersive. So um, that's an emergency room wait time display that we're mocking up for uh, Eastern Health in Victoria. Okay, uh, the other thing to note here is um, this is the uh, this is a, a graphic from a paper we published recently um, with some Indian collaborators, uh, which shows the huge numbers of people that you can potentially reach with, um, in this case, mobile, uh, mobile data visualization, just using smartphones. Um, but in the longer term, there's literally billions and billions of people out there who could all benefit from, from data visualization, but perhaps they don't necessarily have the same level of education and numeracy as uh, people that data visualizations have typically been, been designed for. So there's all sorts of uh, design challenges for visualization uh, going forward. Okay, finally, um, I, I just learned, Tobias just told me that, um, that we had Ivan Sutherland in the opening session this morning. Um, which uh, is really exciting. Um, Ivan Sutherland, of course, is, uh, as I'm, I'm sure was pointed out, is, uh, was a, an amazing visionary in the, the 1960s. And one thing, so there's, uh, this was probably shown earlier too, the sort of Damocles, the very early VR headset. But I think what was really interesting um, in the 60s, Ivan talked about the ultimate display or he speculated what the ultimate display would be. And uh, he described it as a room in which a computer could directly control the existence of matter. And of course, now 60 years later, we, we still don't have that by a long shot, but we're starting to have technologies that uh, give us tangible feedback. So maybe we can't manipulate matter as such, but we can certainly have um, active controls that push back as we reach out and touch things in, uh, in VR displays. So we're, we're exploring all kinds of, uh, all kinds of interaction like that at Monash as well. All right, um, a brief diversion. Um, so uh, another research interest of mine uh, for a long time has been network visualization. And it's really interesting to me because um, quite apart from visualizing quantities, um, network visualizations give you the opportunity to, uh, to understand relationships between things. And uh, you can model almost anything as a network. Um, you, can model, you can even model uh, analysis of quantitative data. So when, uh, when time series curves move together, there's some sort of relationship between them. And so you can, 
for example, visualize the stock market as a, as a network of uh, stocks that move together and stocks that are, uh, move independently or any sort of data. Um, also, of course, the usual examples, social networks. Um, this is a protein-protein uh, protein interaction network, um, modeling, a, uh, modeling uh, things that happen in your body. Um, this is a very large complex network. Um, we typically call something like this a hairball. And I would argue that you really can't see very much structure in this at all. Certainly not in uh, this right one. There's, you know, there's a handful of outliers that you can see on the outside and then it's just a big mess on the inside. So one type of uh, research that we started doing a couple of years ago was using EEG and a whole lot of other physiological measures, um, heart rate variability, as well as uh, pupil dilation and, uh, and subjective um, feedback about cognitive load as well to, to really understand or, and build a hardness model for how the complexity of these kinds of networks affect people's ability to understand them. And uh, the reason for doing this was that for a long time, um, researchers have tried to make visualization algorithms. A lot, of, a lot of visualization research has been devoted to making visualizations and, uh, and graphics for that matter, scale to, to millions and millions of data points. Um, and so this, this study was intended to see if that's really a worthwhile thing to do um, or whether actually probably when, there's, when you have large data, we need to think of a different way to, to visualize it uh, such that it scales. Okay, so the hardness model we came up with analyzing all this data. So we had people looking at these uh, dense networks and performing path following uh, activities. So finding the shortest path from one, node, one particular marked node to another node. And we came up with a model. And what was interesting about this model of hardness uh, related to the density, uh, the number of edges divided by the number of nodes. Um, what was interesting is that it really, it really, uh, it really stops being very effective um, beyond a fairly small size graphs. So, you know, uh, a dense, a dense-ish sort of graph with uh, twice as many edges as nodes. Once you get about 50, once you get above about 50 nodes, you really can't see very much at all. You really can't do this path following task or any other sort of connectivity understanding. So also looking at the EEG scans, we saw some interesting things. Um, according to the, uh, the psychologists that we work with on this, um, the EEG data reveals that the, the easy graphs, so um, the graphs that tend to be in the screen side, they work different parts of the, the brain. So, um, so the easy graphs primarily work the areas of, of the brain associated with spatial navigation, um, while the hard graphs overload areas associated with spatial reasoning and working memory. At which point, you know, you stop getting the benefit of offloading of this information into a visualization. So I would argue that uh, we need to use all avenues to, to, uh, to uh, understand complex data like this and screens aren't gonna cut it. So that's not another argument arguably for immersive visualization. Okay, skip over that stuff. Um, that's a lead in to some work we did in uh, 2016, coming back to this cave two facility that we, uh, that we became the proud owners of in, uh, in about 2014. Actually, no, we weren't the owners, we were just the users of, and actually we had to fight quite a lot to, to get access to it, which is another problem with data visualization centers um, that obviously a shared resource doesn't give you the, the uh, ease, of, ease of access to data that, that one would like. So uh, we did this study to compare what were really brand new at the time, these um, Oculus Rift dev kits to, whoops, sorry, to uh, the more, uh, the much larger uh, immersive interaction space provided by the Cave 2. Um, also much more expensive, I'll point out. So the Cave 2 cost about $2 million for us to, to set up and install uh, here in Australia, whereas uh, these Oculus Rift dev kits were about $500. And um, I know there's a wide variation in price point for, for VR headsets, but they're still, you know, all around. There's, there's many Oculus Rifts, for example, are still about $500 for Quests, for example. 
So uh, orders of magnitude difference in price, but what's the difference in performance when it comes to data visualization tasks? So we tested another network visualization task again, following paths, um, but this was a collaborative task. We asked, we asked pairs of people to, uh, to work together to count the shortest number of hops between, uh, between marked nodes in this network that kind of wraps around them. And they had to reach a consensus before they could advance in this task. So looking first at the, uh, at the headsets, um, we saw really quite um, similar behavior from, from both participants. Um, as you can see here, the participants move around a lot in all directions and quite independently, uh, separating out the vertical head movements. You can see them moving up and down a lot to, to peer over and under uh, complex parts of the network in order to follow this task. But compare that to the cave and what you see is quite different. You see that, uh, that one person tends to follow the other quite closely and look at the same part of the screen at the same time. And looking at the vertical head movements, we see one person moving up and down a lot and the other person not moving very much at all. And uh, the reason for that actually is quite obvious that in the cave, at least our cave, you can only head track one person at a time. Well, you can only show the correct perspective rendering for one person at a time. Um, there are ways to multiplex um, to multiplex the, the uh, different perspective for the different participants, but um, obviously you need twice the frame rate to do that. And so that's never going to really scale beyond a couple of people. So uh, there's a really obvious disadvantage to the K2 for, for collaborative visualization. Um, and that to us was, was significant. And uh, at that point, we, we stopped feeling obliged to use this, uh, this K2 facility nearly as, as much as we, uh, as we had previously thought we might. Okay. Um, so I don't think the sound for this is going to work. Still no sound, Tobias? No sound? Okay. I think no sound. Yeah, no problem. Um, so this is Yulong's work that I, I showed in the introduction, actually. Um, what I wanted to say here is that um, this is, uh, again, coming back to this theme of, well, when does data visualization actually make sense in immersive environments? When do you actually get benefit from the, from the three spatial dimensions as opposed to some sort of projection on a screen? Um, and Yulong did a series of studies uh, using global uh, maps and he found some very interesting things. Firstly, he found that um, when you render data on a globe that you can manipulate and, uh, and move around, even though you don't see the whole surface of the earth, which is at any one time, which is an obvious disadvantage. Um, actually, uh, people are very, very good at, at using this globe representation and just simply turning it to, to, uh, to solve different tasks, for example, understanding the distance between points or to uh, understand directionality on the, the globe surface. But when you, have, um, when you have projections onto a flat surface, there are many different projections possible, but they all try to overcome this loss of information that's uh, necessary when you, when you project onto a flat surface. And uh, so the interesting, and of course, then uh, once you're in 3D, you have all sorts of ways to, to use the, the space for um, additional data like these, uh, like these flow maps, mapping, um, mapping, for example, trade routes or uh, international, uh, international trade or movements of people on, on the map. Um, so a win for VR there. And what's interesting about that and kind of fun is that obviously um, spherical representations of the earth uh, are very old. You know, uh, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, there've been examples of, of uh, globe representations of the earth and uh, actual physical 3D models. And people have been very comfortable at using that for a long time. The projections actually came later. Uh, so it's interesting that, that VR in the 21st century is actually in some sense resurrecting this ancient technology. Okay, um, another example of where, although there are disadvantages to uh, representing data in 3D uh, in terms of occlusion and perspective distortion, this is an interesting example again by our student Yulong. 
which tries to uh, reach a, a hybrid kind of compromise. So what we see here is um, a map. When you view it from directly above, it's a it's a completely undistorted choropleth map, as if as you might see it on the screen. So the uh, the colors of the the states there correspond to quantitative information. Um, and when you tilt it over, let me just pause that. About that. Ah. The map controls in, uh, there we go. When you tilt it over, it gradually turns into a, uh, a prism map, a so-called prism map that the states extrude up into space. And then once you view it completely side on, it turns into a 2D bar chart eventually, you can see there. And so we thought that was really interesting, this idea of morphing visualizations to uh, a morphing interaction that allows you to, to really quite naturally transform a visualization that's optimal from, from one point of view. So uh, the top-down view, the choropleth map uh, shows the geography um, optimally. And then from the side view, you see the pure quantitative information. And then in the middle, you have this prism map, which is, uh, which is a blend of the two. So I'll talk more about transformations in a minute. Um, this is another system uh, by a different student, um, Benjamin Lee. This is an attempt to uh, see what the benefits of, of immersion of immersion are for collaboration. So um, this is a, a few years ago, um, before Quest 2s, uh, we had to lug big backpack PCs to, to use uh, VR without, without cables. Um, cables are a big problem so uh, for moving around freely, as you probably know. So uh, we went out of our way a little bit with these, uh, with these backpack PCs to try and have a, uh, a less, um, to allow freer movement of the participants in our study. And so we had groups of three people at a time that were in the same physical space, but they were completely immersed in this VR world. So they could see each other's avatars and walk around each other. Uh, they managed not to bump into each other, which was great. Um, but they also managed to uh, they also managed to collaborate quite effectively to create visualizations and do a little uh, do a little task that we gave them to understand uh, how they would be able to. The, actually, one of the most interesting things that we were um, curious about was how they would use the space around them. When you're able to to place visualizations anywhere you like, um, what do you do? So we saw lots of patterns. Sometimes people put visualizations on the wall, like that one there. Sometimes they hung them in space. Um, sometimes they use the visualizations as uh, to create little kind of uh, their own private workspaces and, and walls between them and that sort of thing, which was really interesting. And uh, this has actually been a, a focus of a, an, a growing number of, of uh, immersive visualization studies now, how people use the spaces around them to, to do work. Okay, uh, we also allowed them to create 3D visualizations. Um, so, and we experimented with different, uh, different things in the environment like that table. So we were curious whether they would use the table more for, um, for 3D visualizations and the walls for 2D visualizations. Um, in the end, we kind of learned that the table just got in the way and a lot of people just ignored it. So it's interesting that in a, in a VR environment, you don't really need furniture um, or artificial surfaces. People will, will use the space as they need to. Okay. So um, another example of a visualization system, uh, this is actually from a few years ago. Um, some of the, the visualizations that I've shown you up until now, um, particularly the, the globe, they have an inherent spatiality. So obviously the, the 3D um, surface of the globe. Um, it makes sense to map it one-to-one -to, -one to this 3D object as we found in your long study. But when you have purely quantitative data, um, you have a lot more flexibility in how you, how you visualize that data, how you map that data to spatial uh, marks. So 
A typical way to visualize relatively high dimensional data, um, in this case, four different dimensions could be with something like a, a scatter plot matrix. So you have four dimensions on the rows, the same four dimensions on the columns, and all the possible ways to map each dimension against each other dimension in scatter plots in the off diagonal cells in this matrix. Another way is a parallel coordinates plot. So parallel coordinates plots, instead of putting axes on the rows and columns of a, a matrix, uh, each axis is uh, its own line in space. And you link up the, the lines, uh, you link up the axes with one line that moves up and down between the axes, links up the axes, and wherever it crosses an axis uh, is corresponds to a quantity in that data dimension. So axes are very important for lots of types, different types of visualizations. So we decided to use axes as a kind of embodied affordance for interaction. That is, we made it the, the primary uh, the primary affordance for interaction in an immersive environment. And again, this is, uh, this is, this idea was kind of inspired by the writings of uh, Paul Dorish and Donald Norman and, uh, and how they realized that, uh, that different uh, physical interaction affordances allow you to think about, uh, about work and uh, the way that you can interact with computers quite differently the same way that a door handle changes your perception of how you can interact with the door. Okay, so the system we created following this principle is called IMAXIS. And uh, it starts off with a shelf of these data axes. Um, there's a little histogram of the distribution of the points along each data dimension. So each axis corresponds to a different data dimension. And the way that you place the axes in space determines what visualization will show up. So if you place two axes uh, orthogonal to one another, you'll get a scatter plot. If you place them parallel to one another, then you'll get a, uh, a parallel coordinates plot. And all sorts of things in between, like you can link up uh, multiple um, scatter plots and get these kind of two and a half D um, linked visualizations. And you can see it's a really quite natural interaction. You just reach out and grab the axes and, uh, and you quickly learn how to create the different visualizations because you get this, this immediate uh, feedback as the, the different data visuals pop up. And of course, you can have 3D scatter plots, so you can grab a, a third axis and link it to an existing 2D one, and the data pops out into the third dimension. You can create a scatter plot matrix, so you just keep on building out the, the axes uh, in 2D, and you'll get uh, the mapping of each dimension against each other dimension. And we added little affordances to allow you to, to zoom and filter the data, which is a fairly standard interaction. And yeah, there's some really interesting emergent visual, emergent interactions that we didn't design, but once we started playing with the system, we realized that there were quite useful, it was quite useful to just be able to grab two axes and kind of uh, wiggle them next to each other. And, uh, and that would help to resolve ambiguities about which line was going where. And these are some more crazy visualization types that uh, were also kind of emergent. We didn't set out to, to design these. We just realized that once we had the, the facility to create all kinds of crazy visualizations, you could, you could do stuff like this. Maybe that's a little bit too crazy. <laughs> um, so that's that's a more complicated visualization, a tree of linked uh, scatter plots. Actually, it was quite interesting. So we applied the filters in that case. So this is a data set of red and white wines. The white wines are the, the slightly more yellow colored uh, links. Let me go back up. And the red ones were red ones. And so the filters allowed you to, to kind of separate the data in this tree, which was quite nice. 
Anyway, in follow-up work to that, again, we analyzed how people use the space um, to create these visualizations. This was a, a longitudinal study. So we had people come back over multiple weeks and pick up where they left off and uh, also use it to uh, explain their, their data to other people. These were economists working with, um, working with their own data sets. And uh, we saw interesting things. One thing that always seems to emerge uh, in these studies is that people tend to create visualizations uh, in a kind of circular way around them. Um, this study was done with, with tethered headsets. I, I said before that I think tethers can be a, a bit of a problem. And it does make people very cautious to walk around. And so that could be one reason why people uh, create visualizations uh, in a sort of circle around themselves because they don't want to take steps, they'd rather just rotate. Um, and I'll talk more about that later as well. Um, okay. So shortly after doing that, uh, that IMAX, creating that IMAX system, we wondered what it would be like to uh, just create a physicalization of these axes. And the obvious way to do that is to um, build something like this. So this is a set of sliders um, that are paired in each dimension and then placed orthogonally to each other. Um, the sliders have little motors. They're precisely the same sliders that you find in mixing consoles in recording studios. And they have little motors so that the sliders can be uh, can automatically move to, to presets. And we use those to, to achieve a kind of haptic feedback. And uh, that's allows a, a lot of interesting scenarios. So here we're doing a basic kind of uh, slice, slicing interaction with some, um, with some CT scans. And uh, the, here's the actuation, the motors being used to, uh, we call that follow mode, where you can have a, a preset width of the slice and one slider would follow the other. The other thing that we could do with these, um, with these actuated sliders is remote collaboration. So what you see here is uh, somebody in one location um, moving a slider and the slider moving by itself to show um, the remote participants interaction, which is kind of cool. Another way to use it here, we're using a leap motion to, uh, to do the filtering just with finger gestures and the sliders are moving automatically to kind of give you a feedback about um, about uh, where, the, where the slice is. And uh, then you can use the sliders directly to, to fine tune your, your slice. And there it is with some abstract data. So data without a physical embedding, just pure quantitative data and so on. Okay. Um, I'm gonna skip over this example because I could spend a long time on it. Uh, I'll briefly mention those. So, Another aspect of um, immersive environments is that they are very engaging. And uh, an obvious use case for this is uh, data storytelling. And so my student, Benjamin Lee, um, did some work uh, trying to create uh, some existing data stories that you see videos of on the web and things like that, uh, create immersive versions of them. And so uh, we see here, um, Olympic data, Olympic uh, running race data, 100 meter data, and um, all the runners from all time placed against each other. So you can see the difference between historical performance and, and modern performance. Uh, yeah, and Benjamin called this data visceralization because it gives you a visceral sense of, of the data, um, which is, is really interesting and compelling. I, I will say, though, it's, it's kind of hard to define what this visceralization actually means. Um, and I guess that gets back to this embodiment and this, this grand challenge that I sketched out earlier, that we need to understand better what, uh, what embodied, what the concept of embodied data is and what the benefits of it are, how it helps you think about visualization and just uh, the kind of performance, um, time and accuracy of data understanding tasks that we've done in the past. Don't tell the full story about, um, about the benefit of, uh, of embodiment, I don't think. So we have to think a little bit harder about how we study that kind of thing. Skip over the rest of those examples. Um, I might finish off with this example. Um, so this is 
uh, still inspired by the IMAXI's work, um, but at some point we realized that we could make wireless versions of these, uh, of these axes controllers. And that gave you a whole lot more freedom. So let me show you what that looks like. Whoops. Yeah, okay, so um, yeah, the idea here again, to bring data out of data centers and into the world around us and screens just give us a, a window into, uh, into this world of data. Um, I mentioned before the counting sticks, also things like abacuses and slide rules, uh, important historical examples of um, physicalization of data and how it gives you a different understanding of the uh, of the affordances for data, so a slide rule is a really interesting embodiment of, of calculation, as is uh, abacuses. Um, there are, of course, older examples of uh, tangible um, data visualization systems, um, but we like to think that this one is is possibly the the most um, direct interaction kind of of uh, embodiment of um, of a data tool. So here the sliders are, you can see they are still actuated, the, uh, the sliders move themselves. Um, and we explored quite a, a rich design space of all the different ways that we could map these devices to, uh, to the standard uh, so-called visual dynamics of um, visualization dynamics, the, the standard uh, ways of interacting with, with data. So I might just show this little movie and I am aware that time is passing. And so I'll probably uh, have a, one more slide after this and, and then finish. So we built these uh, with a battery and a um, Wi-Fi so that they could be uh, so that they didn't have a tether. Um, this is my colleague Jim using it, uh, using it to interact with a 2D display. So it's not necessarily an immersive device. Um, and here it is with hollow lenses in, uh, in, on a table and you can place these axes anywhere you like, similar to how the, uh, how the IMAXIS system worked. And we did a little study with, uh, with pairs of participants and had them explore a, a small data set and looked at how, again, at how they interacted with each other and um, the kinds of data visualizations that they created. We built six of them. That was about as far as our budget could get us. <laughs> they didn't cost too much they, um, to make. They cost a, oh, maybe less than $100 worth of time. That's a fair bit of, uh, of Jim's very valuable time. So um, here we're using it as a controller for, for IMAXIs in VR. Um, and so we can use it directly to interact with the axes. So you press a button and it creates an axis at the, the place where you, where you press the button. Um, or, and you can use it for ranged remote interaction now. So that, that, uh, that controller is now coupled with that axis no matter where you take it. And you can use the rotator on the end to map it to a different data point, for example. Um, doing filtering with the sliders, coupling it with, a, with a, an axis and then using the sliders to control that axis. There it is, just used as a pointer um, for ranged interaction. And again, in, in 2D. So, you know, we think this is a really exciting space to explore um, the possibilities for how you can, how you can uh, create 
tangible devices that are like custom controls for, for visualizations. And it's interesting to think about because in other domains of like music, for example, people uh, create um, really quite complex uh, or rich interaction interactions with knobs and controls for manipulating sound. Um, think about modular synthesis, for example, people build really quite impressive consoles uh, that give them really direct control over, over lots of different aspects of their, their sound design. Um, why don't we do that for data as well? Why not? <laughs> okay. I might jump to my last slide now. Okay, so um, just to conclude, there are lots of really interesting uh, empirical results starting to emerge. And this is one thing we wanna focus on more is really trying to, the, the, the results of some of our studies have been quite qualitative that I've, uh, that I've shown you so far, you know, looking at how people use the space around them, like here. Um, but there are starting to be really quite um, concrete results showing uh, showing benefits to more traditional data visualization tasks as well. So, um, so this is one by some people at uh, Constance University, and uh, they looked at when you've got truly um, three-dimensional quantitative data, and you're trying to understand the relationships between all three dimensions at once, for example, identifying clusters, then there are really concrete benefits to, uh, to representing it in 3D. Um, also, uh, interesting results starting to emerge about how you can uh, how you can navigate around these environments really easily, and how you adapt existing uh, navigation techniques from existing two D data visualizations into immersive environments. Um, another one that we've recently so this was a, a VR paper actually from a couple of years ago, um, looking at how you do. Uh, small multiples representations. So arrays of um, small visualizations um, laid out in the space around you for to enable kind of comparison tasks. Um, and we particularly looked at the, the layout of these, uh, of these displays. So flat versus semicircular versus fully circular. And uh, we've since done a, a more formal study testing spatial memory using different curvatures of displays and um, really interesting results about that. That's, that work is actually under submission at the moment, so I can't say too much about that. Um, it is becoming very clear though that you don't want to go the, the fully wraparound route. Um, people don't like to rotate too much, even though um, other studies have shown that when people uh, work with visualizations in immersive environments, um, certainly when they're, they're new users, they tend to not walk very much, but rather uh, arrange the visualizations in a circle around them. So we need to do better to figure out how to support people in using the space around them uh, and also better understand um, what the ideal is. Um, things like the semicircular display rather than fully wrap around and then create uh, automatic um, automatic arrangements of visualizations that support that. Um, that's probably a good place for me to stop, um, Tobias, before I go to overtime. <laughs> um, but I'll thank you again for having me um, and I'll, I'm very happy to answer all your questions. Thank you, Tim. It was really great. So let me thank you also on behalf of the audience. Um, so yeah, uh, it's really, really exciting topic. And I think it's really a good example of, of combining the different uh, communities, the BIS community and the VR and AR communities. Um, and there are already a couple of questions. So uh, while I know that we run a bit uh, tight in time, I still want to ask you a couple of questions that are brought up. So the first one uh, actually by, asked by Nikki Cartledge, I think it was a good one and was right at the beginning of your talk when you, when you showed uh, um, the alien example. And the question was, do you see sonification having a role in your future research? Because alien was, was actually a bit beep beep, <laughs> as you said. Yeah. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I'm really interested in that. In fact, not just not just sonification, but all um, using all the senses, multi-sensory um, representation of data. Um, so I have not personally done a lot of work um, in that area. I would love to make all of our visualizations go beep or, or make nice, you know, nice, uh, nice dissonant sounds when you know to show 
um, correlation, weekly correlated data versus nice harmonizing sounds when, when you have correlated data, things like that. There's, there's a huge design space to explore there. Um, I'll just go back to uh, the aliens example. Um, I mean, obviously in the movie, it was used for dramatic effect as much as anything, but, um, but uh, yeah, I think that's a huge space. I'll also mention that um, my colleague, Kim Marriott uh, at Monash is very interested in, um, in visualization for the blind. So he's done a lot of work on creating, um, linking sort of touch displays to, uh, to sonic displays of data and using haptics firstly to, to give you a, uh, a kind of tangible representation of the data but supported by sound. So uh, a little yeah. advertisement for his work, but I'm, I'm sure there's lots of others doing that sort of thing. Uh, there, was, there was another question, which I shot a bit from, from Pablo Figuera. And um, basically his shorter question is more, how can we support understanding of a visualization and a collaborative scenario with people with different devices? Because you, many of you, you, you showed actually different devices, but most of your scenarios then in itself, all the user use that same device. Have you explored also that mix or any, any comments on that? Um, I know that the, we've got good friends at, at UniSA that we've worked with quite a lot. Um, Mark Billinghurst, I believe has, has done some, some work um, actually, perhaps not specific to visualization, but certainly looking at how to do collaboration across um, asymmetric devices. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting challenge. I mean, there's, there's some obvious scenarios that are very compelling as well. For example, you know, uh, people in a control room using some sort of large uh, shared display versus uh, perhaps operators in the field using augmented reality. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah, I think I think it's very interesting. Um, I haven't. We've gone to some trouble to tr try and explore the the most symmetric collaborative environments possible. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, they still. Uh, uh, I probably can't do all the questions, and they 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 come in. And um, uh, at least for Nikki Kartovich, she asked the question uh, uh, about zonification, and uh, she would like to discuss it further. And I would encourage her to to actually also reach out to you via email. Uh, probably uh, uh, some of the more last questions. So based on, um, based on your 3D graph study, do you think there may be more potential benefit to research on better ways to do spatial data layout of graphs as opposed to VR, AR graphs? I hope that question was clear. Um, I From Richard Breath, by the way. The is, is yes, there's a lot of work to be done on uh, I mean, there's different ways I could un I could interpret that question too, but uh, I think um, there's a long history of, if we talk by graphs, we're talking about networks um, or layout more generally, you know, just this general problem of how do you arrange space around you to, to use it as effectively as possible. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done and um, it's been really well researched on screens, but not nearly so much in immersive environments. And so, yeah, please, please, if you have ideas, Okay. And, and maybe as a last question, so again, for the rest of the audience, uh, 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 Tim, you, you can just easily Google him. Maybe he will also be around for a couple of minutes longer. Um, uh, uh, but reach out to him uh, via email. As a last question, uh, also something that was asked, and I, I slightly reworded, is so normally, you know, even when we do VR, AI is always usually very computational expensive. Uh, now you will also visualize sometimes relatively large or complex data sets. Uh, so basically one question was, what is the computational cost to do such a, a particular causal discovery in VR for large time series or climate data? Um, well, I guess, I guess there's multiple aspects to, to the computational cost for, for that kind of analysis. I mean, there's the, there's the computational cost of, of you know, doing, uh, doing climate models is, is very large and generally done in supercomputers. Um, the actual cost of, of rendering lots of information on the screen or lots of information in immersive environments at once. Um, I, I think we're at a point actually where, uh, where we can render plenty of information in the environment. Our headsets and our computers driving them are really capable of rendering, you know, tens of thousands, if not millions of, of on vertexes and you know this and represent more complexity than than we can really take in so i think the the interesting challenge there 
is actually to understand human perception better and uh, yeah. what kinds of, of human interpretability are. And uh, that's what I sort of alluded to with that, that uh, early study I showed, um, looking at how people could, uh, could what the limits of complexity were on, a, on 2D rendering of, of networks. And it's relatively small, the outcome of that. Yeah. So, so again, I would like to to uh, thank Tim. Uh, thank Tim, and again, please please reach out to him if you have further questions. And I see there are many are, and already lots of comments in in discourse. And 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 thanks you. So again, thank, uh, Tim for for acting as our first keynote speaker here and showing a really interesting combination from the this community and VR community and how how they can be really productive and open up new research avenues. So thanks a lot. And um, there is now uh, roughly a twenty minute uh, break. Uh, before the first paper session starts. So also uh, as a reminder for the speakers, uh, if you have a paper in one of the next uh, uh, sessions or if you sessions uh, chair for one of the next session, uh, please you can, you can go in that session a bit earlier uh, to have a test talk, test everything um, and, and get ready. Again, thanks, uh, thanks Tim. And uh, it was great to have you as a speaker here. Thank you. Thank you. Recording so stopped. I stopped the recording. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm just seeing. So there, there, there are lots of. Actually, I was not sure if you if you fully registered. Uh, there are lots of uh, of uh, um, uh, questions and, and comments and clappings and in, in the Discord channel as well. Uh, um, yeah, and I, I hope that people uh, reach reach out to you, and that you get additional feedback. Uh, please do feel free uh, yep. to contact me by email. Um, is probably the best way. Um, yep. <laughs> and and sorry, I'm not I'm not sure what what, what happened uh, with um, oh, with, the, uh, with the audio. It right. we tested it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, didn't, uh, didn't oh yeah, he has one one question. Maybe maybe Rob Bellman is in there. Uh, you didn't talk about IATK, and I see the GitHub repository hasn't been uh, has been quiet. Will you provide updates on this in the future? Oh uh, yes, so. Um, there's a number of people been working on that. Not me, myself personally. I haven't been contributing uh, code to that, but uh, Maxim Cordil um, was probably the, the driving force behind that originally. And I, I think continues to work on it, although less and less as he becomes a, a more senior researcher himself. But uh, my student in particular, Benjamin Lee, has been doing a lot of work on uh, with IATK and is yeah. working on a, a new library actually that uh, adds um, a, uh, a tools for creating transformations between different types of visualizations using IATK. So, that, so uh, watch that space. Yeah, good. Uh, the, the person, uh, Rob Bellman, or Bellman, uh, says thanks, Tim. Uh, and there was one question, and I'm actually also interested that that controller uh, that you that you built. And I, I really like this idea of, of combining. There's so many aspects of there. You have physical controllers and the aspect. Uh, Will you make them available to buy? I guess the answer is no, but you might surprise me. Or are there, uh, uh, do you release any information? So for example, Vincent Haller to ask that question, can, can build it himself or replicate that? Yeah, there, there, is actually, um, there is actually a GitHub. I believe that uh, Jim, who was the, the main person actually building those, uploaded the, um, the schematics. Um, so there should be enough you know, the circuit diagram. So there should be enough information to, to build it yourself. Um, if not, feel free to, to reach out to us and, and we'll share more information with you. Yeah, we'd love to see those things. Um, yep. All variations, improvements on them uh, appear in different places. Come in. Yeah, cool. With that said, um, I will close the session now to also release Tim uh, to well-deserved coffee. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you have a beautiful day uh, in uh, over there in Monash in Melbourne. And I hope even more so, uh, that I'm able to visit you uh, uh, in, in person oh, later no, this year. <laughs> yeah, and um, thanks again for, for the remaining participants uh, uh, to, to join the session. I hope you feel, I felt equally entertained and inspired as, as I felt. Yeah, thanks Tim, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, everybody. Please come to Australia when you're able and we'll be <laughs> to, to host lots of people. <laughs> Bye.